crickets in the back of the room. Um, they is spray painted 2023 on the crosswalk back there and on the sidewalk. They're, I think they're actually getting like investigated for that because it's just like vandalism. Like they can't just like clean that up that easy. So they're like actually going to get it. And then they also. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to not sounds. be able to walk at graduation. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is Grandparents come in from out of town and then you don't even get to walk. You still get your diploma, but. Yeah, I don't understand that. Like, the school is not going to be opposed to, like, some pranks, but, like, when it's spray painting yeah. and stuff that has to be cleaned up, like... The spray paint, the that's silly string. There should be... There's, like, a really, like, hard line between vandalism and a prank. Well, like, the silly string, if you don't clean that stuff up quickly, it becomes, like, concrete, basically. It gets silly. It gets silly. Oh, that's what I should do for a senior prank. Just pour concrete over it. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think it would be a great senior prank if you just concreted all of the teachers to their desks. Well, they would notice that. Would they, though? I mean, the teachers. Like, Ooh, maybe come in and, like, put, or, like, super glue all the chairs to the floor so that yeah. like, try to, like, that would be the one. one. That would be the one. Okay. Don't hold me accountable for anything I say. If that happens to like work out next year, it wasn't me. Well, I will remember because I'm recording, so. Crap. I'm on tape. Yeah, the wire guys don't say anything incriminating. Way. Incriminating? Yes, that works. I asked AI what I should do for a senior prank. And he said uh, that I should try filling the hallways with balloons or covering the lockers with vacuum paper. Wait, we don't have balloons. Or filling the hallway with cups full of water. Yeah, that's that's already been done before. That's oh. like. I overheard some people guess, saying uh, they bring a cup in it was one of those soccer kids. Okay, our bells are turned off here, but we need to get started. Um, you guys had a bunch of handouts this morning to pick up. We will not make it through all of those. Um, this is our work for today and for Monday, but we need to make some progress on it. So if you didn't staple those together before class, then you need to wait and do that here later. Christian, do I need to tell you what to do? No, sir, I will. Okay, then do it. Just do it on your own. <clears throat> yeah, it, it looks bigger than it is because uh, it's all kind of spaced out. But the first page is the one that has a big box on here. So my goal for this part is uh, this is where we're going to have all of our notes so that we have one place to look at for these. Um, and then we can kind of wing ourselves off of these as we go along. So what I'd like to start off with is the three that we talked about last class. And I'm not going to spend too long on those because we already spent some class time on those. Um, but that was how to find x-intercepts vertical asymptotes and holes. Now, you're welcome to copy down what I'm copying down, but you're also welcome to reword it if you can, uh, I don't know, summarize it in a way that makes more sense to you. So for x-intercepts, it occurred for any x values that made only the numerator zero and I focused on the word only last time. Vertical asymptotes were x values that made only the denominator equal to zero. And I focused on the word only there too. Talked about why that's important. And then finally, holes were x values that made both zero. Um, Tyler, this is the stuff that's not on your final, so you're welcome to follow along if you want to. And if you need to work on your review, that's okay too. Sounds good. Bless you. Okay, and then for holes, when it has one, which it doesn't always, which is why there's so many of these questions, because not every question has an x-intercept, not every 
question is going to have a vertical asymptote. So you really have to practice several of these just to practice each one of these things. Uh, a couple times. But when it has a hole, the y value came from plugging in the x value into the reduced function. And reduce was an important part of that. You plug it into the original function, you get 0 divided by 0. Now again, I'm not going to focus on these parts too much because we already did practice 10 of these last class. Or we practiced a few together and you're supposed to do some for homework. Um, but let's go ahead and answer those question types for number 1 and 2 just really quickly. And then we will jump back and talk about all this other stuff and get a few practice questions under our belt. Okay, so for all three of these, I need to think about what numbers make the numerator and denominator zero. And I'm just gonna do questions one and two at the same time. Because question one, the numerator never equals zero. One is never the same thing as zero. Question two, the numerator, I can easily tell you it equals zero at two, and his denominator equals zero at four. So sometimes you don't have to factor it to see that. But sometimes, like the denominator in question one, you do have to factor to know what makes it zero. So in this instance, we should distribute or factor out a GCF so that we can see how to factor the trinomial, just so we can see which numbers make the denominator zero. This equals zero at two, this equals zero at negative three, and three never equals zero, so that doesn't give us one. Well, sometimes you got to do some factoring to figure that out. Sometimes it's a little bit easier than that. But to apply those three things that we talked about last class, any number that makes just a denominator zero is a vertical asymptote. Those are vertical lines, so we need to write them as x equals. Any numbers that make just a numerator zero are going to be x-intercepts. Those are points, so should we should write them as points. If the numerator never equals zero, then you're not going to have an x-intercept. Don't leave it blank because it looks like you don't know how to do it. Say none or not applicable. And holes only occur if there's a number that makes the numerator, the same number makes the numerator and denominator zero. So that is not questions one or two. Now before I remind you of the other stuff that you should have seen in Algebra 2, let's go ahead and throw this stuff on our graphs because ultimately we want to know what this graph looks like without a calculator. That's really the understanding of the uh, function, analyzing the function like this. So points, of course, are going to look like points. Uh, but asymptotes, whether it's vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote, or slant asymptote, need to be graphed as dashed lines. So here's x equals 4 for question 2 x equals 2 and x equals negative 3 for question 1. And that actually is going to be really helpful for our graphs. So that pretty much sums up the part we talked about last time. And again, the reason why I insisted that you do those parts last time, so that would be you'd feel a little bit more comfortable with those and wouldn't feel like that was new information. But of the others, again, it doesn't really matter what order we do these in. Um, but I'm going to pick out y-intercept. I just think y-intercept is probably the easiest of all of these. And like any algebra stuff, all y-intercepts have an x value of 0. So I would probably say plug in 0 for x and solve for y. Again, you're welcome to make that a little clearer by putting it in your own words. But let's do that for questions one and two. Question one, if I plug in zero for x's, I get one over zero plus zero minus 18. So negative 1 18th. And question two, plugging in zero for x, I get negative two over negative four, which reduces to one half. 
and these are both points so if you are required to make a table you might as well throw them in the table and you're gonna see that we don't need many points to make these graphs probably not as many as you would expect but we should put those points on the graph now negative 1 18th is really really close to zero but make sure you see that okay any questions about y-intercept we're okay with that okay then horizontal asymptotes we actually had to review this earlier this year for infinite limits limits as x approaches infinity and negative infinity and to do this we have to compare the degrees of numerator and denominator which created three scenarios because either the degree of the numerator could be bigger or second scenario the degree of the denominator could be bigger or a third possibility the degrees could be equal so if the degree of the numerator was bigger what type of horizontal asymptote do we have y equals leading coefficient over leading coefficient, none, and y equals zero. Um, Not if the numerator's bigger. That's if the denominator's bigger. Um, then none. And this one is leading coefficient of the numerator over leading coefficient of the denominator. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I do think I, you guys know I try not to make you just memorize stuff because I don't think that that sticks long term anyway. But this second one should kind of make sense. As x gets really big or really small, y gets closer to zero. That's going to be a question like number one. Because think about as you make these x values bigger, if your numerator is stuck or growing much slower and your, your denominator just keeps getting bigger, this fraction gets closer and closer to zero. So that's what's going to happen. So we compare these degrees, the degree of the denominator is bigger, so y equals zero. We compare these degrees, they're equal, so we do leading coefficient over leading coefficient. Now both of those are asymptotes, so we can graph those as dashed lines. Or not, not only can we, we should. And those are also very helpful for us to know what our graph is going to look like. Okay, and then that leaves two things. And then knowing how all this fits together to make the graph. So next up would be slant asymptote. Let's go up here. Now slant asymptote is probably the one that is the most amount of work, but luckily most questions won't even have a slant asymptote. Um, also, if you've ever heard of oblique asymptote, it's the same thing. I think this is like in America we usually say slant but most of the rest of the world calls them oblique but they're the same thing so the when when it's going to have a slant asymptote it's only going to have a slant asymptote when the degree of the numerator is one bigger than the degree of the denominator. So you really want to do that check first because as I said it's kind of a pain. The how, if that's true, and we're gonna go through all these questions until we find one that has one so we can practice one of them, you have to do long division, so not a coincidence that we've reviewed that recently, and your slant asymptote will be y equals whatever the quotient is. 
So if there's a remainder, you get to ignore it. Remainder has no impact on the slant asymptote. Okay, so look at the equation in question one. Is that going to have a slant asymptote? because the degree of the numerator is zero, degree of the denominator is two, the degree of the numerator has to be one bigger than the degree of the denominator. So most of the time, that's all you're gonna have to check. That one's gonna have a slant asymptote. Number two, the degree of the numerator is not one bigger than the degree of the denominator. So number two does not have a slant asymptote. But let's move on to question three so we can at least practice this once while it's our topic we're looking at. Question three does, the degree of the numerator is three and the degree of the denominator is two. So it takes about five seconds to know that there is a slant asymptote, but it's gonna take us several minutes to figure out what the equation is. So we have to do, my computer will cooperate, long division And to be fair, this long division question is a touch harder than normal because it has some fractions in it. But I'll show you that if we break it up into pieces, um, it's fine. It's still very doable without a calculator. So what I would say is the first part of my quotient, should my first part of my quotient be positive or negative? Good, because a negative times a negative gives me a positive like I want. What number can I multiply by three to get one? One third. Good, multiplying by a third is like dividing by three. And then how many x's do I need to multiply by x squared to get x cubed? One. So if you do it in three parts like that, it's not so bad. If you try to do it all at once, then it's kind of overwhelming. So negative times negative is positive. One third times three is one x times x squared is x cubed. So this is the first part of our quotient. Okay, then we have to multiply to these as well, but negative times negative is positive. One third times three is one, and x times x is x squared. And then the last part, negative times a positive is negative. Multiplying by a third is like dividing by three, so 18 divided by three would be six, and we have one x. Change the signs and add. And well, then it kind of teases us, kind of wants us to just cancel everything out. That's why you have to be careful about changing the signs because these add to zero and these add to zero, but those don't. And if you just glance at it, you might think that they do. Okay, so the next part, I don't need any x's. It's going to be times x squared and I want x squared. The next part should be positive because a positive times a negative gives me a negative. But what number can I multiply by three to get two? Two thirds. Very good, so if you multiply by one third, it's like dividing by three and gives you one. So if you want it to be two, you need to then multiply that by two. I wanna multiply it by two and divide it by three. So we do that, we get this term, that's where that came from, then multiply it by this, Then multiply it by this. Again, it's like divide by three, which would be six times two would be 12. I'm going pretty quick here at the end, but that is because I can see that I'm getting down to a remainder. And for slant asymptotes, the remainder has no impact on the slant asymptote. It is just the quotient. So again, it's kind of a pain, but you only have to do it every once in a while. Most questions don't have a slant asymptote. Also, most of the time, the long division doesn't have fractions either. Now, because this is an asymptote, just like vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes, we should graph this as a 
dashed line. We've got a y-intercept. This is an mx plus b format. Y-intercept of two-thirds. A slope of negative one-third. So count down one, write three. And it's not part of the function, it's just part of the asymptote, so make sure it's dashed. Okay, well let's go back and finish the notes. We have just one more thing to add about domain. And of all of these, that's the one you should feel most comfortable with, I believe, because domain comes up in all kinds of math stuff. But what I would probably put for domain is something about um, to a way to describe the x values of the function and or his graph. So it's kind of like you just are explaining what x values make sense to plug in for this function. Now this is pretty easy to answer after we have the graphs done. So questions one and two will fill in these blanks after we talk about what the graphs look like. But a way to describe the x values for the function or for the graph and or the graph. Okay, so now we need to talk about how to finish these graphs. They're actually pretty close to being finished. I've just been adding this stuff to the graphs as we've been looking at them. Now sometimes, like question one, we're going to need more points. I don't know enough about what's going on in this question. Question two, I've got enough points. But you also have to know how the graph is going to interact around these asymptotes. It's going to do something around vertical asymptotes and it's going to do something else around horizontal and slant asymptotes which is actually good because it helps makes our graph a lot easier. Um, but in this case, we need more points. So in this question, I'm probably not going to try to find out what y is when x is 10, partly because it's off the graph and partly because I don't want to have to do that in my head. If I have a calculator, then I would just graph it in the calculator to begin with. So instead, I pick something easy, like maybe 1. So if we plugged 1 into this function, it's going to look like this, which is negative 1 twelfth. Also very small, but negative 1 twelfth is bigger than negative 1 eighteenth. If you have to share your dollar with 18 people, you're getting less than if you're sharing your dollar with 12 people. Um, that's pretty good, but I think I could probably stand to get maybe another point. So I'll try something over here like maybe negative 2 and see if that's reasonable to do without a calculator. So this would be 4 times 3 would be 12 minus 6 minus 18. This would also be negative 1 12. Now, it may not seem like this is much progress, but this is actually perfect. This is exactly what I need. Now, if you picked different x values, that might be fine. More x values is always better. But here's how this is going to fall into place. So question one. Again, this value is not much bigger than these, but it's a little bit bigger than these. So that's good because it tells me it's going up and then back down. There's a little bit of a curve there. And what's going to happen at every vertical asymptote, when you get close to dividing by zero, it gets that vertical spike in the graph. So sometimes it goes to infinity on one side and negative infinity to the other side, or vice versa. It goes to negative infinity and positive infinity. So this problem, the fact that this is going down, means it's still going to go down. And so it must be going to negative infinity on this side and positive infinity on that side. Likewise over here, from right to left, it looks like it's going down. So we can assume it's going to keep going down. And if it goes down on the right side, he goes up on the left side. 
So that behavior around vertical asymptotes helps us get a lot of the rest of the graph. And to finish it off, for both horizontal asymptotes and slant asymptotes, those tell you what the graph approaches as x gets really big. It gets close to this horizontal asymptote. And as x gets really small, what, it, what it's going to approach. So I really only needed a couple points to kind of know the direction here. And then once I knew it was going down on this side and down on this side, I knew it was going up and up on those sides. And then that was enough to kind of fill it in. Now to do the graph in question two, I don't think I even need points on this one. It's a little simpler graph. I know these two are going to be connected. Based on the direction of it, I can tell it's going to negative infinity on the left, positive infinity on the right. And for horizontal and slant asymptotes, this tells us what the graph is approaching on the far left and the far right. Now, I would insist that you graph those and see that those look correct in your calculator, um, but my calculators are currently gone. They took them for AP testing, so I'll pull up one or two graphs here today. But to finish these off, uh, we still need to finish domain. So I'm going to do domain down here because I think once you have the graph, it's pretty easy to see. Domain, I can see I'm hitting all of these x values. So everything from the far left up until x equals 3, negative 3. Then I'm hitting all of these x values from negative 3 to 2. And then finally, everything from 2 forever to the right. So I'm trying to color these three little intervals here for you to help you match up with where these three domain intervals are coming from. Over here, we've got everything from the far left, negative infinity, to 4. And then we have to skip 4 because it's division by 0, but then 4 to infinity. Whether it's a whole or a vertical asymptote, if the function's undefined there, then it should not be part of the domain. Domain is describing what x values are part of the function. Okay, so let's look at one more together, and then I will give you a few minutes to try question four and let you see what parts of this are sticking and which parts are not. So question three, we already did the slant asymptote, which is the bulk of the work. And what I'm going to ask you to do in question four is probably start with the part that you feel most comfortable with. Lean on the stuff that's easier for you. Use your notes for the stuff that's less comfortable for you. But as you do these questions, you should be leaning on your notes less and less. So I don't know. What do you all think is the easiest of these to answer? We can do it first. Which one of these questions? Um, okay, horizontal asymptotes, fine. So if you know the rules, compare the degree of the numerator to the degree of the denominator. If the degree of the numerator is bigger, you don't have a horizontal asymptote, then that part is finished. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but just so you guys know, if you carefully read the definition for horizontal asymptote and carefully read the definition for slant asymptote, you should see why it's not possible to have both of those. If you have a slant, you can't have horizontal. If you have a horizontal, you can't have a slant. Okay, what else would you say is on the easier side? Okay, I would say y-intercepts probably what I think is the easiest. I get to just plug in zero for all these x's. 0 minus 0 minus 0 divided by 0 minus 0 over 18. 0 divided by 18 would be 0. That's a point for our table. That's a point for our graph. Domain is pretty easy to do after we can see our graph because we can see what x values it hits. But what am I going to need for these three? Right. I need to know which ones make each one of these zero. So we would want to factor the numerator. It has a GCF and a trinomial. 
factor of the denominator. He has a GCF. And a trinomial. And again, it's fine to slow down on the factoring. The accuracy is more important than the speed there. But Okay, so now that I'm looking at the factored form of the numerator, x equals 0 at 0, x minus 3 equals 0 at 3, and x plus 2 equals 0 at negative 2. The denominator, negative 3 never equals 0. x plus 3 equals 0 at negative 3, and x minus 2 equals 0 at 2. And that's the bulk of the work. You do have to know the definitions, but the rest of this falls into place pretty quickly. There's no number that makes the numerator and denominator zero, so there's no holes. There's three numbers that make just the numerator zero, so there should be three x-intercepts. How should I have known zero, zero was an x-intercept? Because it's zero, zero. Right, the origin's not just a y-intercept, it's also an x-intercept, so that makes sense. And then vertical asymptotes, are for x values that make just a denominator zero. So it's a lot of work to get one of them, but once you do one of them, the other two shouldn't be too much work. So if you were required to make a table, you've got two more points to add to it. If you were required to make a graph, you've got two more points. And you've got two new asymptotes. Asymptotes should always be graphed as dashed lines. You're welcome to get more points. If you're not sure if you need more points, then you probably should. It should help you catch some mistakes and it should build some confidence in what the graph looks like. But if you really know how this graph is going to interact with these asymptotes, I think we've got enough. Because based on this point, this x-intercept, and this slant asymptote, just like horizontal asymptotes, your graph will approach the slant asymptote as x gets really big and really small. So based on this direction that I know it has to end the problem with, it's going up on the right side of this asymptote, which means it's going to the bottom of that side of the asymptote, which is good and consistent with these points because it's got to go through this point. And instead of just continuing to drift up, I also know this point, so it must go up some and then it's got to turn back around, which means it's going to the right of this vertical asymptote, so up on his other side. And then finally, he has to approach the slant asymptote as x gets really small and really big. Let's see if I still have this one graphed or not. I don't. So I don't have this one. Apply for this one more time. So, so it doesn't apply to this one, like what doesn't apply? What is it? I don't know what you mean by it. Uh -uh. And one of the biggest misconceptions is that it can't cross the horizontal asymptote or the vertical asymptote. It actually can in the middle. If, you, if your graph has three or more sections, my graph could have gone up like this instead of like this. And this is why sometimes you need a couple more points just to be sure of the direction. So. Okay, and now that I've got all of that in front of me, the domain, it looks like I'm hitting all of these x values, which are negative infinity to negative 3. Always put the smaller number on the left. It's hitting all of these x values from negative 3 to 2. And it's hitting all of these x values 2 to infinity. Again, once you have the graph, 
you can just see what x values are being hit. Okay. Um. All right, so I would like you to now try question four. And I'm going to recommend that you start off with start off with the blanks that you feel the most confident about, the ones you shouldn't need to look at your notes for. And that can be different for each one of you, but hopefully you feel okay about a couple of them. Then try the next hardest ones, and then the next hardest ones, and then the next hardest ones. And at some point you need to look at the box on the front page, and that's fine. You're only on question four. But as we do these, you need to try to use those examples less and less. Use your notes less and less since you wouldn't have those on the test. So for this, let me give you a good like seven minutes and then we'll go over it and help uh, reteach some of the stuff that may not be coming as quickly as the other stuff.
Yeah, number four is fine. retake it next year. Well, I can do credit recovery for like a week or two weeks of the summer. Okay, one more minute and then I will go over four quickly but give you a chance to see what the answer should be and give you a chance to ask some questions. Because again, there's a bunch of practice on all these handouts. So as long as you feel like you're getting better with each one, then by the end you should be in good shape. That should all work. All of it should be nice and consistent with each other. Negative 12 divided by negative 4 is 3, right? Positive 3. Did you say negative and negative? Yeah, 12 divided by 4 would be 3. I don't know. We'll see in 20 seconds. Now, also, I realized that at first, these questions are kind of a pain, but as you guys are getting these definitions down, this is all that you should be doing. So there's seven minutes, which I know is not enough time. A lot of the times at first, um, but that's okay. So let's do horizontal asymptotes first. That's what some of you guys suggested earlier. Looks like the degrees are equal. So Y equals leading coefficient over leading coefficient. If you know how to find that, that's a nice question because it doesn't take step after step after step to get the answer. It's just right there. You just have to know where to get it from. I think y-intercept is the easiest because you get to plug in 0 for x and solve. So you get negative 6 over negative 12, which reduces to 1 half. It's only going to have a slant asymptote if the degree of the numerator is 1 bigger than the degree of the denominator. That's not true here. If it was true, I'd have to do long division and keep y equals to quotient and ignore the remainder. For these three, I need to know which numbers make the numerator zero and denominator zero. So the numerator is a trinomial to be factored. The denominator, you should really factor out the GCF first. Always, always, always take out GCF first. It makes it easier. Then I can see the numbers that make the numerator zero and denominator zero. Anything that makes just a denominator zero is a vertical asymptote. Anything that makes only the numerator zero is an x-intercept. And anything that makes them both zero is the x value of the whole. Now, if what threw you off on those is that you didn't factor those correctly, then that's the part you need to slow down on. You don't factor those correctly, you get different numbers here, you get different three answers for these three blanks, and then your graph gets really confusing because it's not all consistent anymore. Okay, then to find the y value, I need to look at, this would be the factored version, 
I probably should have written these a little bit closer on top of each other, but this is the numerator factored over the denominator factored. To find the y value of the whole, you need to plug it into the reduced fraction. So let the x plus 3 cancel out the x plus 3, and then plug it into what's left. So the numerator would be negative 3 minus 2, and the denominator would be negative 4 times negative 3 plus 1, so negative 5 eighths. Again, as I said, I would go over each of these quickly. And part of that is, I just don't want to, if I do each of these slow and in depth, then it takes forever. It's easier for you guys to ask the questions you need to ask. But of course, that depends on you speaking up. So of these six parts, are you guys okay with where these came from? Is there any of them you'd like me to repeat again? Okay, then let's throw all this onto a graph. We've got two points, zero, one half, two, zero. And even though the whole is not a point on the graph, you should still be graphing it as an open circle. That is an expectation. And it may not seem like it's very helpful, but it is helpful. You'll see in a moment. We can graph our vertical asymptotes of x equals negative 1 and x equals negative 1 fourth. That would be above the hole here. If you put the hole above the asymptote, then again, it's going to feel kind of awkward because it's not going to be lined up perfectly. Sometimes you need more points, but I think we've got enough on this one because I know these two are connected. I can see that this is going up to infinity, which means it must be going down to infinity on the other side. For horizontal and slant asymptotes, it tells me what the graph is supposed to approach on the right and the left. And then even though it does not hit this point, it's skipping this point at the hole, it's going to hit the points right before it and the points right after it. So that's still very helpful for our graph. And then all of that connects together, everything fits together nicely. So that's a good sign. If there was anything that conflicted any conflicting information, then that's where I would be concerned. Now, I am concerned about this, though, the domain. The domain is going to be negative infinity to what? <coughs> Very good. Negative 3, there's no y value here. So it's not just vertical asymptotes, it's also holes. This just hasn't come up in the first three questions. That's why we need lots of practice. We can hit all of these x values and then negative 3 to negative 1 and then negative 1 to infinity. Domain doesn't care why you can't divide by 0. Your domain doesn't care if it's a whole or a vertical asymptote. It just knows that you can't divide by 0 so you need to take it out. I'll write it up here. Okay, so you need to try to pick out one or two of those to make some progress on. And then move on to question, question five. So same thing, feel free to start with what you think is the easiest. Put some good effort into the ones that you think you're close on before you look at your notes, but when you get stuck, feel free to look back at your notes on the front page. I will give you one hint on number five, just because I don't want you to have to restart the whole question. There is a negative sign out front, so you might want to squeeze that negative sign next to the four so you don't forget about it. And on the x squared? No, because that would just cancel. 
Only, yeah, so that would mean like it wasn't negative and it is negative. Yeah, I'm just tripping. Okay, so let me give you a few minutes head start once again. We'll go over all of that. What time's the bell? Or not bell, but like next class? Uh, 125 is when your next class is. Oh, usually it's 225. Okay. It's a different schedule, I think. Yeah. It's like an hour early. I don't know why you're saying that, like you're telling me. I'm fully aware. I'm just doing math on my head. Well, let's do math on your paper. You're just jealous, bro. <laughs> math on your paper. It's 2 minus 1 is 1. Oh, I get what you mean. I get what you mean. I'm sorry. Degree of the numerator? Three. What question are you looking at? I see. Why are you on question 10? I'm going through all the horizontal asymptotes because it's like super easy. Okay. We'll save some of them. It's good to make your brain think about them again on Monday. The more times you think about it, the more likely it is it's going to stick. I want you to try to answer all parts of five. Yes, that's everything dog. Try all parts of five.
So for this one, before I go over it, again, it's fine if that was not enough time because you will see that you get quicker at these as time goes on. Let's look at the graph first, and we'll backtrack. So if you got a graph that looks like this, most of your answers are probably fine. But just very quickly, I notice it doesn't look like it crosses the x-axis. It doesn't look like it crosses the y-axis. So probably no x-intercept no y-intercept looks like there's probably a vertical spike somewhere here and a vertical spike somewhere here so i'm going to guess that there's probably two vertical asymptotes and it looks like it's probably approaching zero or something close to zero on the right and the left so it looks like there's probably a horizontal asymptote now the calculator doesn't do a good job of showing holes or anything like that so i can't rely solely on my calculator and of course, we would not give you a calculator on this so that we could test to see what you actually know. But some of the quick stuff, this does not have a slant asymptote because the degree of the numerator is not one bigger than the degree of the denominator. He has a horizontal asymptote because the degree of the denominator is bigger than the degree of the numerator. Y-intercept, if you try to plug in zero and solve for Y, you get negative four over zero, but you can't divide by zero, so that doesn't make sense. If you set the numerator equal to zero, negative four never equals zero. So there's no numbers that make just the numerator zero. So there can't be any x-intercepts. And if there's no numbers that make the numerator zero, there's no numbers that make both the numerator and the denominator zero. So there's not gonna be any holes. And with a GCF, you can see that the denominator equals zero at zero and three. So three vertical asymptotes, or I'm sorry, two vertical asymptotes. So this graph, you didn't have as much to work with because there was no points given to you just by doing the required stuff. But you could have a vertical asymptote here and here. You have a horizontal asymptote here, but you need some more points. So don't plug in x equals zero. We've already determined that x equals zero can't be on our graph. Plug in something easy like maybe one. If I plug in one, I get negative four over negative two, which reduces to be two. Maybe try x equals two. You would get negative four over negative two, which reduces to positive two another positive two. Um, I still not quite sure about the direction of this graph, so maybe I would try x equals negative one. Just trying stuff that I think is easy to compute. Negative one comes out to be negative one. And you're welcome to do more points or different points, but now I feel pretty confident about what's gonna happen because I know he has to approach the horizontal asymptote on the far left. Based on the direction of the graph, he must be shooting to negative infinity on this side of the asymptote, so positive infinity on this side, which makes sense for it to hit this point. And then he must, if he's going down here, he's gonna keep going down, but he must come back if it's really supposed to hit that point, which would then tell me he goes up on this side, down on this side, and then approaches horizontal asymptote at the end. So if you, again, I don't have classroom calculators, but I guess you could use Desmos or if you have your own, but if you change your window settings from negative five to five and negative five to five and you graph it, it should look like a pretty accurate graph. It's not perfect because we didn't plot hundreds of points, but if something was wrong, it would give us a good hint about what we should have done differently. If we only saw like one vertical spike and we said there was two vertical asymptotes, that might give us a hint about what part of our work to look back at. Okay, oh, and then I guess domain. So domain 
it hits all of these x values, negative infinity to zero, all of these x values, zero to three, and all of these x values, three to infinity. Okay, you guys still have one more minute. No. Okay. You have 15 minutes. What? 104 plus 21 equals 125. Correct. Oh, 15 minutes till you can ask questions again? How about you just let them talk? What? My bad, my bad. The time that you asked for earlier was when your next class was, not what the end of this class was. Oh. So you're going off of different information. Oh, okay, so 120. That 120. So, so you guys 15 have minutes. 15 minutes. 15 now. And I would like you guys to do one more question, please. So question number six. Again, that's a long time, so I think that's enough time to put in good effort on that. Um, if you want to come compare it with the calculator graph. I will graph it on this one for you to come see, but only after you try it. So I'd like you to do question six at least, and maybe more importantly, this box on the front page, while all this stuff is fresh in your head, and you know which ones you're pretty good at, and you know which ones you're struggling with, and we just talked about some of these, Consider rewriting some of those definitions. Consider being more detailed. Consider squeezing in some examples. Something that's going to make it things go a little bit smoother for you on Monday when we practice more of these. But to be very clear here, you do not have to do all of these pages before Monday. I just this is our assignment for today and Monday. So get through at least question six with uh, good fidelity, please. Nice that the moving up ceremony is inside this year instead of outside. I don't know why they haven't had it outside. It just seems like. I don't know. I think the gym's going to be kind of crowded, but. Oh, yeah, it's going to be crowded. There's going to be a lot of people. Well, a lot of people aren't going to be Seriously? Well, I'm thinking more like on the floor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I'm glad they're not doing I heard Color Guard is like doing something too. Ew. Yeah, I mean, it's like the first part's a parade, so like all the big clubs yeah. and stuff. Why do you need to guard seven colors? Do you, do you only see seven colors? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's all I need. 
I see combinations of colors. Actually, I only see three colors. One. I only see two. Black. I'm actually monochromatic. Christian, do you think that one's stupid? They twirl little flags around with little. I've never seen that actually do it. Uh, in like high school musical. I've never been to a football game. I mean, some of the stuff the color guard does is actually pretty cool. Oh. Uh, like, colorful. have you ever, could, do you think you could throw up a rifle and Absolutely have not. arms in the air and catch it perfectly? I don't without shooting myself. Not with a real one. Take, you, like you can try it with a real question. I won't sign that. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> you finished, Luke? No, because no, they want to shut the hell up. But. Luke, that wasn't very nice. I don't think we appreciate it. No, I don't think so. Wow. There's a cookies and calculus thing on Sunday for last minute calculus study, but I don't think I'm going to go. Just going to stay home, play video games. get my chores done. I gotta do laundry, oh, yeah, I guess dishes and clean the kitchen. I need to go grocery shopping. I kind of forgot that Might need to mow chores. the front yard. Yeah. Just adopt a kid to do that for you. That's what they're for. Oh, you just said the most apparently. <laughs> uh, kids are for doing chores. Hey, get two of them. Double the work. Like, like, or wine okay, before you feed them, that should be enough. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever thought about having kids? Why are you asking all these questions? Could you finish this question? Like some people just, don't just do the question. Too. Finish the one question I asked you to do. Before. I did like five <laughs> minutes ago. I've been bored out of my mind. Did you check it? No. I checked it in my mind. <laughs> I am. 
agree with Luke on this one. My head is a TI 84 plus C E F. I'm pretty sure you made that up. Or did you read it off the board? No, I read it off the a little. You read it off the thing, yeah. Okay. Well, you know when he turns on this like little online calculator? And it's not like everybody knows what a TI 84 plus calculator from Texas Instruments says made it two plus. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm hearing is I didn't ask you to do enough. Oh, no, 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 so no, no. Next I'm time, still working, but actually, man. What you're telling me is next time I need to make sure I give you a lot more. I forgot to draw the rest of this line and do some more calculations. I don't want to do that. It's stupid when I'm complaining about it so much. Wait, what would he see? Is it a Dude, Ben's gonna be out, gone from this class for like two days straight. It's gonna be horrible. Okay. Yeah. I need mean, that's that's bad with me. I've been in here one day over with me. I need to go like Harris Cut. I don't remember anything. When? Yeah. I just did, and I want to like kill myself. I'm not gonna get another one again. Do y'all have siblings? Like I feel like y'all are just desperate to argue with people. Really? No, I have.